Well, we are right on time. Uh, and so I am delighted to introduce our next guest. Um, Dylan Scott is a senior correspondent for Vox, where he leads the organization's healthcare coverage. He previously reported for STAT, National Journal, Talking Points Memo, and Governing Magazine. Uh, Dylan was Vox's lead reporter on two international reporting series uh, supported by the Commonwealth Fund, uh, the first on how other nations achieve universal health care, uh, and the second on how some countries have excelled in their COVID-19 responses. Uh, he reported an investigative feature on short-term health plans uh, for a Vox collaboration with the Center for Public Integrity, uh, and he's the author of Vox, the Vox Care newsletter, uh, which I highly recommend. I'm a, I'm a subscriber. Uh, since coming to Washington, D.C. in 2011, Dylan has covered the biggest political news of the day, uh, Supreme Court rulings on the Affordable Care Act and gay marriage, the opening of diplomatic relations with Cuba, uh, the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and the 2016 presidential campaign. He's broken news on major developments on Capitol Hill, uh, interviewed some of the most powerful people in politics, including Joe Biden, and traveled across the country to tell stories beyond the Beltway. Uh, Dylan, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Well, thank you for having me, Ryan, uh, and thanks to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society uh, altogether for, for hosting this event and appreciate everybody uh, participating and coming on to, to hear me talk. Um, so yeah, uh, Ryan had asked me uh, to talk a little bit about kind of what comes next on the healthcare beat. Um, you know, we are slowly, fitfully, partially, uh, you know, exiting out of the out of the pandemic, uh, you know, not all at the same time, not all with the same risk, but that transition uh, is certainly underway. And I know it's, uh, you know, the pandemic has obviously dominated all of our uh, time and attention for the last couple of years. And so I think it naturally raises the question, you know, what do we do now? Um, and so, you know, I was thinking about this, that, that question, um, and reflecting on my 10 or so years at this point of being a healthcare reporter. Uh, and it occurred to me, like, all of my time uh, covering healthcare, you know, has kind of been defined by these clear epochs. Um, you know, there was the pre-implementation ACA, where, you know, the dominant storyline was about, you know, state, state decisions on uh, the health insurance exchanges or uh, Medicaid expansion, you know, everything that it was going to take uh, to get that law up and running. And then in 2014, we kind of entered the post-implementation ACA period where, you know, obviously that started with the bang uh, with the, let's say, uh, troubled rollout of healthcare.gov. Um, but then there was, you know, the exchanges were up and running, expansion started, we started to see some of the the direct effects of those policies and provisions. And so that was kind of, you know, a nice, neatly defined period of, of healthcare coverage. Um, and then we had, you know, the Trump years, which in a way were this kind of like weird interlude. You know, we obviously had uh, the repeal and replace debate for the first year. Um, but then once that uh, fizzled out, you know, it was, it was a little bit, I felt like of an in-between period. Um, you know, obviously the administration was doing stuff with, uh, regulation and there was like a, a fledgling democratic debate about like how much bigger and grander could our healthcare policy plans be. Um, but we were, I feel like we were, yeah, kind of in this in this in-between period until COVID struck. Um, and then obviously for the last couple of years, it's been the pandemic emergency um, dominating most of our, uh, most of all of our coverage. Um, and so, yeah, wh where does that leave us now? Um, and in my mind, we're kind of, we're, you know, a month ago, I would have said we're entering a, a new kind of like post-pandemic era of, of health care and of health coverage. Um, I would add, addend, uh, amend that now to say, you know, post-pandemic and potentially post-Roe, uh, depending on how uh, things unfold at the Supreme Court. But the point is, like, almost every healthcare story going forward, I think, will be touched uh, by one of those two threads, either the, the lingering uh, aftershocks of the pandemic or, you know, this new uh, reality in the reproductive health care space uh, that might be ushered in by the courts. Um, so today I'll, I'll focus on the pandemic, but uh, just to give one example, you know, with Roe uh, and kind of, you know, that's, that's relevant to our hosts, you know, I was talking to somebody actually just this morning uh, at the National Women's Law Center, um, and one of the issues that she raised was the possibility of pregnant women 
uh, accessing cancer treatment um, in a, a state that has uh, passed an aggressive abortion ban uh, af if Roe end up, ends up being overturned, which I, was a really striking example to me of just how, you know, how far the tentacles of these kinds of policy changes can reach. Um, you know, that it's, there's always obviously the, the first order effects, but then there are second and third order effects. And I think it's, you know, our job as uh, healthcare reporters to help readers understand kind of, you know, what, how the dominoes fall and why they're falling. Um, but to, to turn to the pandemic specifically, uh, for me, you know, and I don't presume certainly to speak or think for everybody else, but I thought I'd share a little bit about how I'm going to be thinking about this going forward. Um, I think the pandemic will have two uh, dominant legacies that will that will affect my coverage going forward. Um, so one is the the effect on patients. Um, obviously, you know, millions of people have been infected with COVID. Uh, some of those people are still living with complications from their infection. Uh, obviously, there's long COVID, which could potentially be a, a significant and long-term public health problem that we're still wrapping our ha hands around. Um, you know, there's been the, the mental health, the stress, anxiety, and grief uh, um, that people have felt during the pandemic that I think will have a uh, longer range effects um, on their well-being that, that we'll want to be keeping track of. Um, but beyond, you know, the direct effects of the virus, there was, there have been all these kind of secondary effects, you know, disruptions uh, to healthcare that could be felt for a long time. You know, one story that I've I've written, and I know I'm sure others in this uh, on this call have written, uh, was about the delay in cancer screenings that we saw uh, over the course of 2020, in particular, and the fact that you know by the end of that year we had accumulated a pretty significant deficit in people who had not gotten you know their routine colonoscopies and other screenings, um, and that's you know that's the the effects or the consequences of that disruption to care is something that's going to take a long time. Uh, to play out. But so, you know, those, those are some various ways I think that, you know, the, the people we are writing for and about uh, how their health has been uh, affected in ways big and small uh, by the pandemic. And I think that that uh, will be an important thing to track uh, going forward, you know, and, and generally speaking, I am interested in, you know, in terms of that disruption, you know, what happens when, when people do get disconnected from the healthcare system, you know, one, open question I have is like, all right, so somebody's, you know, annual physical might have been canceled by their primary care doctor for whatever reason, because COVID cases were, were high at the time. You know, what, what happens after, you know, if a year goes by, you know, do we, do they get linked back up with their primary care doctor? Do they just kind of, you know, fall, uh, fall off the radar? And if they do, you know, what are the consequences of that? So I think there are all kinds of ways, both sort of like very narrow and acute, as well as sort of more larger, almost kind of conceptual or thematic uh, that I think the health of the American public has been and will continue to be affected by COVID. Uh, and I think that will be one of the really important threads uh, going forward. The second, in my mind anyway, is uh, the effect of the pandemic on the business of healthcare. Um, you know, obviously uh, hospitals, doctors, practices, um, the pharmaceutical industry, like the pandemic, has had huge implications for each of those lines of business. Um, you know, things like the labor, uh, the nursing labor market have got a lot of attention already. And I think some of the problems um, in that sector have been have been laid bare by COVID. You know, we've had uh, a loss of independent primary care practices. There was a spike in retirements for, for uh, physicians early on in the pandemic. And so, you know, I think the uh, longer range effects on on access to care from those those kinds of things will be important to track. Um, you know, obviously the hospital uh, sector is where a lot of attention has been paid during COVID. Um, you know, not only have we seen like the closures of whole hospitals, but like specific lines of service uh, have often been targeted um, for termination. You know, I wrote a story about uh, maternity wards that have closed down. Uh, as a result of the pandemic and some of the demand drying up there. Um, and I think the long-term care industry, broadly speaking, you know, given the levels of uh, sickness and death that we saw in those facilities, um, that that will, you know, the pandemic will continue to have uh, kind of long-term effects there as well. Um, and in and, and a more kind of, this is not something super empirical or quantifiable, but I have a sense that um, the 
pandemic experience has made the problems of the U.S. health system, you know, more tangible for people, more relatable, you know, a little bit easier to grasp, you know, I'm not saying, you know, obviously, especially if you were sick before COVID, you were acutely aware of some of the issues that the U.S. health system has. But I think, I think, you know, two years of the spotlight constantly being shown on the ways that which uh, U.S. healthcare was coming up short has just made, you know, uh, normal people, normal readers more kind of literate or conversant in some of these things. And I think that that is an opportunity for us uh, as reporters to, you know, get into more complex stories potentially, and also to uh, maybe think a little more ambitiously about how to cover uh, possible solutions. Because I think that certainly the pandemic has, has created a greater interest in how we might fix uh, some of the problems that we've seen. Um, so beyond that, you know, I see, so I see those, you know, the, the effect on patients and the effect on the healthcare business as being kind of the most uh, important kind of longer term threads, you know, following from the pandemic that I'll want to be keeping track of. Um, you know, I think there are general themes from the last two years that will certainly stick with me, you know, the disparities uh, in US healthcare, the relationship between social determinants of health and health outcomes. Uh, the overall kind of disconnectedness of the U.S. health system. All of those, you know, are things that were, were true and were relevant before COVID. But again, I think COVID just made them uh, all the more inescapable um, or harder to ignore. And so I certainly plan to continue uh, to honing in on those, those, um, those themes with the stories uh, that I pursue going forward. Um, and yeah, you know, I think... Uh, I think that this is a, a really important moment um, for U.S. healthcare and for U.S. journalism. You know, I, you know, because if there's there was ever a time that we were going to fix some of these things, it would be now. Um, you know, I wrote a story last year uh, about South Korea um, and their, you know, why, you know, trying to explain why they seemed uh, so much better prepared. Uh, for COVID, at least at first. And it went back to their experience just a few years earlier with MERS, the Middle East, uh, Middle East and Respiratory Syndrome. And that, uh, that had been a, a national embarrassment. South Korea had the worst, um, the worst outbreak outside of the Middle East of MERS. Um, and so they snapped into action. They passed a bunch of health, public health legislation. They gave the government you know, new funding and new authority uh, for surveillance and quarantining and contact tracing and support for the uh, diagnostics industries, all, you know, uh, uh, kind of all above, uh, all of the above approach. And when they were doing that, you know, they had no idea that uh, just a couple years later, there would be a global pandemic that would, uh, you know, disrupt normal life in a way that none of us uh, has ever really seen. And likewise, you know, us sitting here today, uh, we, uh, we don't know when, when the next uh, public health emergency is going to come or when, um, you know, all of the flaws uh, with U.S. healthcare that have been uh, impossible to ignore in the last two years will, will be exposed and will be pressed on uh, again. So, you know, even though I know and I, I certainly agree that it's not our job as journalists to be advocating for specific solutions, uh, I do think we can continue shining a light uh, on the ways that we are still living uh, with our failures during the pandemic, uh, on the pre-existing problems that COVID made impossible to ignore, and on the ways uh, that things could get better. So, yeah, it's it's a bit depressing to consider that, like, COVID will probably be a piece of uh, my coverage almost on a, on a permanent basis going forward. But, you know, the, the, the magnitude of what has happened this last two years is, I think, that significant. Um, and I just think it's a fact that, you know, both, both like I said, with, with the health of individual people um, and also with, you know, the, the functioning of our healthcare industry, uh, the effects of the last two years are going to be felt for a long time. Um, well, well, Dylan, thank you so much um, for that uh, for that food for thought and uh, look at kind of the, some of the, the lessons you've learned. Uh, encourage everyone here to type your questions for Dylan. Uh, I'll either read them or take you off of mute. Uh, and in the meantime, um, I, you know, I've, I've got plenty of questions. You know, we, we were we were talking. You know, that we were, the theme of this was sort of. Uh, healthcare coverage beyond the pandemic, but I, I, I do have a pandemic question for you. Um, you know, a, a few days ago, uh, the, the president made some remarks about the importance of um, preparing for the next pandemic. Um, how are you feeling? 
I mean, the, 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 the last two years, uh, you know, as, as sort of a, 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 a lay person, it doesn't give me tremendous confidence, but, but perhaps you have, you have another perspective. I'm not sure. No, I think cynicism and pessimism are appropriate. Um, you know, you look at the struggle to uh, insert any pandemic preparedness funding into either a reconciliation bill or a, one of the other government spending bills. You know, we can barely get, uh, as uh, the White House was talking about earlier today, uh, we have struggled to get Congress to appropriate more funding for like the fall, for like, you know, of six months from now, uh, much less, you know, uh, um, setting aside resources to prepare for a pandemic in 5, 10, 15 years. Um, so, you know, I think there's like a lot of good work being done, certainly, you know, in the think tank space, this is, you know, this is their moment, you know, to come up with, with possible solutions to all the problems that we saw during the pandemic. And I think they're doing that, you know, there's literally a group out there um, that's being run by the guy who ran the 9-11 commission, basically trying to kind of replicate that that uh, group's work, but focused on the failures of the pandemic response. Um, and certainly, you know, I think at the state and local level, um, you know, the we just have experiences now that we've never had before, you know, we've stress test the system uh, in, in a way that we never have. And so like, you know, I'm certainly optimistic in a sense that like, you know, the country would be better prepared now for, for something like this than it was uh, in February of 2020. You know, we certainly know what the playbook looks like as, you know, uh, polarized as, you know, some of our response to it has been. Um, but I don't think so, but I don't think at like the sort of central, federal, national level uh, that I have a lot of optimism that like, we're going to have the kind of uh, fully formed, uh, well thought out playbook that, for example, South Korea had coming out of MERS uh, in anticipation of COVID. So I think it'll just be a mixed bag of like, we'll certainly learn some lessons, we'll certainly be better prepared. Um, but like, if people expect us to, you know, come out of this, yeah, having having a really detailed playbook that like we can pick up and put into action immediately if, you know, SARS 2025 um, ever arrives. I'm I'm not particularly optimistic about that. Oh, that's uh, that's that's depressing. Um, Dylan, tell tell me a little bit about uh, you know I I know some of us in uh, you know the advocacy space, those of us who work with uh, patients, you know, kind of started off um, the year with quite a bit of optimism. We had uh, no no surprises act take effect, which. One of our previous speakers acknowledged was you know, probably the most significant health legislation since the Affordable Care Act. Um, we had a lot of uh, kind of patient-focused reforms in the BBB and the Build Back Better, and Build Back Better. Um, but that's but that's stalled, uh, and it's it's and it's looking like um, you know we we could wind up. You know, I don't want to progn prognosticate about the election, but it looks like we could have. Um, you know, an interesting couple of years ahead of us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where 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 are you? You know, as as you're sort of you know weighing you know your your feelings about you know what's what's ahead for patients. Um, are are, are the, do you expect kind of any any big re pro patient reforms coming out uh, at the federal level anytime soon, or or has your pessimism grown lately? No, I mean, yeah, I I would expect at best for Congress to kind of do the bare minimum, right? So there are some, uh, there were some expanded subsidies uh, as part of the first, the American Rescue Plan that passed at the very beginning of this presidency in Congress, uh, there were, uh, they enhanced some of the Affordable Care Act subsidies, made them more generous for some people who already qualified for them and made more people eligible for them. And so I think there's a pretty strong compulsion for Democrats to, and, and that those enhanced subsidies were only, uh, authorized for two years. Um, so they, I think, expire, if I'm not mistaken, uh, starting next year. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a, you know, there's a pretty strong compulsion for Democrats to try to do something about that. Um, you know, if they do anything that costs money, I do think there's still, um, there's at least a lot of energy around drug pricing. Obviously, the ambitions about what could be achieved in that space have shrunk significantly over the last year or so but you know if they need to pay for something like you know permanently extending the ACA subsidies uh, they might look at, at drug pricing reforms to, to help pay for that um, but beyond 
so basically kind of beyond of that, that kind of maintenance stuff, you know, basically not allowing a couple million people to lose uh, their health insurance subsidies ahead of a presidential election, I don't have a ton of optimism. You know, I do think the surprise billing issue had kind of uh, reached such a fever pitch that, um, you know, kind of forced Congress's hands. But as, you know, as everybody, most people on this call know, I'm sure, and I know people in the advocacy space do, you know, that was pulling teeth to get something like that passed. Um, so there's not a lot of, uh, I don't think there's a lot of uh, kind of bipartisan agreement on where to go on healthcare. You know, Democrats have been spending the last few years kind of dreaming big only to have those dreams uh, kind of run into the realities of governing and their very narrow majorities in Congress. Republicans, you know, I don't think really are that interested in touching this space after the embarrassment of, of repeals failure. Um, and obviously, you know, if Republicans were to win back the House at the least um, in the fall, then that leaves us with divided government where like the bare minimum of like keeping the lights on, keeping, you know, various extenders and authorizations going is about, is about all that you can expect. So I, I, if I were looking for action, it would probably be more at the state and local level and more in just kind of how the, the industry itself kind of responds or, or starts to reimagine itself given some of the lessons of COVID. Um, Br Brittany has a really interesting question. Um, if Brittany can come off of mute and ask her question. Or if um, if we're not able to unmute her. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, sorry. all good, all good. <laughs> um, before, you know, with swine flu and other viruses or diseases, they've never really been politicized the way COVID-19 has. So I just kind of wonder, you know, through your reporting in the past couple of years, how that politic, you know, that the politics kind of changed maybe the way you reported on COVID-19, especially like, you know, some of the more, this is what you need to do to be safe and things like that, those type of stories. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if that maybe has affected the way you'll continue reporting in the future. That's a great question. I mean, I do think the problem of, you know, misinformation and disinformation has obviously been with us before COVID, but to your point, like it, 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 it just, you know, became unavoidable. Um, especially because it was so often, uh, you know, directly challenging what, you know, our nation's leaders or public health authorities were telling us. Um, and in terms of going forward, you know, strangely enough, one of the things that I will probably carry with me is the importance of like actually understanding kind of where those people were, are coming from, where they get their information from, and why um, kind of why they are so steadfast uh, in, in those beliefs. And like, that's not necessarily a thing, you know, I have written a story, like I wrote a, wrote a story on vaccine hesitancy that was very explicitly about all of those things. Um, but I think also, you know, it, whenever you're writing, you know, whenever I've been writing about the COVID response, I have tried to have that in the back of my mind you know, just because it helps to frame, it helps to frame, you know, what public health experts are saying folks should do. Like, you know, what what people are hearing, you know, on social media from their friends or family, um, like that 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 colliding with public health um, guidance um, or or other recommendations is like that's where we live, right, as reporters. Um, and so, like, I think at least like having a like you can't afford to just kind of ignore that stuff, pretend that it's sort of like you know, uh, cordoned off in its own crazy part of the internet and it doesn't really affect how, what you write about or how you write about what you write about. Like I, I think, you know, in ways, like I said, both explicit and less explicit, um, it, it's important to at least recognize that like, that is part of the audience for, for some, some of the things that you're writing about. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if that, I don't know if that directly answers your question. You know, I am certainly interested in, you know, this is this is maybe separate, but like the the law, like the political uh, legacy of COVID, I think will be fascinating because it's certainly my sense at this point that the folks who are running against the public health consensus, the people who are villainizing, 
uh, public health leaders that like that, if there's any energy remaining um, behind COVID politically speaking, it's on that side of things. Like there's not, I don't get the sense that like there's a ton of uh, appetite or like political capital to be gained out of being really aggressive about trying to, uh, trying to stem the spread of COVID or anything like that. Like, I think the attitude we've seen people like Jared Paulus in Colorado take of like, you know, we've given people a chance to get vaccinated and now we're moving on. Like, I think it's telling that that's where, you know, Democrats are. And then obviously, you know, Republicans, there's a wide range, but like, there are certainly some people who see a lot of purchase uh, in, in uh, placing themselves in opposition to, to the public health consensus. So for that, I mean, that's, that I think only adds uh, more reason to like, you know, engage pretty thoughtfully and directly uh, with, you know, whatever you want to call, um, you know, the folks who, who question or challenge, um, you know, on, especially on dubious grounds, um, the public health guidance um, and recommendations that we were getting. You know, one of the things that's been so fascinating to me over the last couple of years is our country just had a huge experiment, probably it's huge, huge, hugest experiment ever with universal health coverage. You know, it was, it was just for one thing, uh, but, you know, huge experiment with universal health coverage. Nonetheless, I, I'd love it if you could just spend a moment talking about um, your international reporting and, and sort of, um, you know, what, what you learned and the perspective, you, you know, you had as an American and, and perhaps what was, uh, you know, A, most surprising to you as you looked at other countries' healthcare systems and, um, you know, any, any there's probably a lot of lessons that may be learned, but, you know, any, any lessons that perhaps could be learned and, and um, maybe uh, applied uh, to U.S. policy. Sure. Yeah. So the project Ryan is talking about, um, basically what we did was we traveled um, to countries that had different types of universal healthcare systems. So we went to Taiwan, which has basically single payer, pretty close to like a Medicare for all type program. Uh, we went to Australia, which has this like hybrid public private program where, you know, there's sort of a baseline public program that covers everyone. But then if you'd like to um, and can afford to, you can buy private healthcare on top of that. Um, and then uh, in a very structured way, like that's true in a lot of places, but like Australia is very intentionally kind of set up this, this two-tiered system. Uh, and then I also went to the Netherlands where they have very tightly regulated, but technically uh, universal private health insurance. Um, and, you know, one of the first lessons that came out of that to me was that like, there are there are a variety of ways to achieve universal health care and it, each system kind of reflected the unique characteristics of its country. So I think in Taiwan, um, you know, there it, it reflected, you know, a, a pretty cohesive country um, that had seen like the war, you know, before they instituted this program back in the 1990s, they had like 40% uh, on insurance. Um, and, you know, there was just kind of in their, in their nature to go for this kind of universal equitable approach um, to solving the healthcare problem, you know, with Australia, which, you know, I think of often as kind of American, America's cousins, um, you know, I think it reflected both, like, Australia does have, and there was this great uh, New York Times piece by Damien Cave uh, about Australia's COVID response, if you haven't read it, um, and it, he really kind of boiled it down to the trust that people have uh, in the government and in, in each other there, and, you know, I think that partly for, it, it, you know, Australia is this weird kind of tension between, like, the kind of individualistic pioneer spirit. Um, and then also like there is, um, you know, I think a, a pretty strong sense of, of social cohesion that, you know, I'm just spitballing here, like maybe is born out of like, you know, obviously they, they weren't the first people there, but like, you know, this was a country that was kind of created out of being sent way, halfway around the world. Um, and then you have to figure it out on your own. Um, and so they're, they're kind of hybrid system uh, made a lot of sense. And in a different way, you know, the Netherlands, which obviously has like a very strong uh, kind of mercantile history and kind of capitalistic spirit. Um, nevertheless, likewise, there's, there's there, I think, a strong sense of, of social cohesion. And so this tightly regulated but private insurance um, seemed like a kind of natural reflection of kind of where the Dutch are at as people. And so like, to me, that that suggests like, there, there certainly must be a path to universal healthcare in the United States. And it's honestly, 
without even getting as ambitious as something like Medicare for all, it's not that difficult to imagine um, how, how we might get there. I mean, the ACA is already a, a couple steps down that path. But the other thing that you know, all of those countries have done uh, that the United States has not is they have just made a commitment to universal health care. You know? um, uh, that, that is just something that, has been, that they've made collectively a priority. And, and in the United States, somewhat uniquely among European and uh, Asian, you know, wealthy Asian countries, like we have never really made that kind of determination. And so I, I, I will be curious in terms of how this intersects with COVID going forward. Like I said, like I, I have a general kind of sense, and I think there has been some polling to support this, that like, to your point, Ryan, like people have now, they've seen the flaws with American healthcare kind of laid bare as a result of COVID. And we have had these kind of temporary experiments in a, in a, in a different kind of healthcare, um, you know, covering COVID tests and treatment at zero cost to the patient being the most, uh, the mo and vaccinations as well being the most obvious examples. So I don't know, you know, I I'll be curious if there's sort of a, a longer term more permanent uh, shift in attitudes that might make uh, change more possible. On the other hand, you know, obviously the most powerful kind of bulwark against any major reforms tends to be the healthcare industry. And, you know, given, you know, the battering some parts of the industry have taken over the last two years, I'm sure the last thing that anybody there wants to do is like, imagine how we can <laughs> do things like more cost effectively or uh, how we can save money by paying them less. Um, so yeah, no, I think, um, I think there are lessons certainly to be learned, especially at sort of the thematic level about how a country goes about achieving universal healthcare. You know, the United States uh, is a very unique beast in terms of the, the particulars of our healthcare system, the particulars of how we cover people. Um, and so I think it's about whether we can translate that general energy into like specific solutions that would, that would work here. I certainly, I, I think that's a longer range uh, goal, but I don't think it's impossible to imagine the COVID experience being like the start of something that maybe gets us closer to universal healthcare down the road. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's very exciting to hear. T tell me about, uh, you know, mo most of the journalists who are either uh, on the call now uh, or who are going to be receiving the recording of this are, are local reporters. They're uh, writing for local local publications or, or perhaps um, publications that cover state government. Um, you know, what what advice do you have for them? Um, you know, many of them are, you know, like you looking at, okay, what am I going to be covering beyond COVID? You know, what, what stories do you think are out there for a local journalist, uh, you know, for a local newspaper or a local radio station uh, to be pursuing in the, in the health space? So to me, I mean, I think whatever is happening in your local healthcare market, whether as a result of COVID or um, in general, and it's probably a mix of both, can be really fascinating grist for, for stories. So like everybody has a local hospital system, surely. Uh, you probably have, you know, doctors or clinics that have been affected by the pandemic. Um, and obviously, you know, with all of those businesses, like, any, any changes to the services that they provide is going to affect patients and their ability to access care. Um, so, you know, healthcare tends to, in the United States, tends to kind of function at the local level, right? Like you have your local hospital system and it's this like, you know, spider web that reaches out to outpatient clinics. And then you have, you know, independent doctors that may or may not have a relationship with the hospital. Um, and so I think kind of all the links in that chain, um, you know, will have inevitably been affected by by the last two years. And so I think kind of teasing out the ways in which, you know, kind of the face of your local healthcare market has been permanently altered by, by COVID is, is one potentially really fruitful uh, line of inquiry. And then, you know, certainly at the local level as, as much as any, you know, what patients are going through, whether that's, you know, people who are living with the lingering effects of COVID, whether that's some of the people I was talking about earlier who have seen a, a disruption to healthcare and are now trying to like figure out how to make up for lost time or are living with some of the consequences of delayed care. Um, you know, I think, yeah, in, in both in terms of your local healthcare market and, and what's happening with the patients in your community, um, you know, those are, I think those, like the threads that I was talking about earlier are going to reveal themselves 
uh, in those places, especially. But I, yeah, I can't emphasize enough, I don't think, that like healthcare, yeah, healthcare markets tend to be like these little bubbles. Um, and I think, especially for the folks on that, this call, the more that you can kind of explain what's happening and why and how it's going to affect uh, patients and their ability to get the medical care that they need. Like if you're, if you're doing that, you're, you're on the right track. Um, Lucy Culp has a question. So let's um, unmute Lucy. And then after you answer Lucy's question, let's unmute Harris because he has a related question. Um, so let's hear from Lucy first. Is you all hear me? Yes. Oh, yay. Okay, sorry. Hi, Dylan. Um, hey, so following up a little bit to your comment earlier about kind of the COVID experiment towards universal coverage, you alluded to it a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about um, if or how you're seeing the politics shift as a result of of kind of the last two years, and and particularly I'm thinking about I mean, this almost relates to Harris's question, but um, I'm, you know, thinking about the primaries and, you know, kind of where the the two sides seem to be headed when it comes to, you know, universal coverage or or just solutions to the extremely, you know, bifurcated, segmented healthcare system we have today. Are you yeah. seeing a shift at all as a result, or kind of what does that look like? So, I mean, I, this isn't the forum for it. I'd be curious what other people think, but my sense is that like the kind of the, the, the game has not like changed in any kind of fundamental way. And I think that again, goes back to sort of the intractability of uh, the healthcare system as we've already set it up, you know, the influence of uh, major special interests. And like, I think a bit of like probably fatigue on Capitol Hill, like, you know, Democrats not, are only just 10 years ago passed a big healthcare reform bill. Uh, Republicans, not five years ago, uh, tried to pass a big health reform bill. Um, you know, obviously they've uh, done quite a bit of at least short-term healthcare policy making with uh, the COVID, various COVID relief bills and made you another one, small one, um, hopefully here um, in the next few weeks or months. Um, and so I, I think those things have all probably combined to make like the near term likelihood of action pretty small. Like, I just don't think there's a ton of appetite for it. I think everybody does still wear scars from those past two uh, political fights. You know, Democrats obviously took a schlacking in 2010 and then Republicans turned around and took a schlacking in 2018. So it's like, there's not, at least in the near term, it doesn't seem like there's a ton to be gained from being from getting being really aggressive about reforming the healthcare system. And I get the more of the sense that it's like, all right, what's like the bare minimum that we can do to kind of, especially get through this, this current emergency. Um, where I, but I, I, but I know I was talking, I just said a moment ago to Ryan that like, I do have some longer term optimism, but I think that is more in it's subtler and will take longer to reveal itself. You know, if there is a, a kind of some kind of shift in how the general public thinks about things like universal health care, um, you know, if it if it encourages uh, candidates with more ambitious uh, health care visions to get into politics, like I think those are things that um, might start to pay off in like five, 10 years. Um, but I think it's like, you know, there, there's a great book by Paul Starr and I'm going to get the title right, wrong off the top of my head. Um, so let me try to look it up. But he, Remedy and Reaction, which is basically the, uh, describing this like cyclical nature of healthcare reform in the United States, which is like, we try something, people get really mad about it. So we kind of fall back, but then the problems are there, still there. So we try something again and people get really mad. It's sort of this circular, this circular pattern. You know, I could imagine, and so I, I think COVID may, it's possible that COVID will sh sh uh, shake things up, um, but I do think that it will take a while before we really know. And I do think, honestly, it's entirely possible, plausible that in like 10 years, 
um, all of us could gather on a call and sort of, you know, laugh sadly uh, at how little has actually changed um, since the pandemic. So, yeah, I think that this is it, it's it, it's one of the big kind of unknowns, um, and I just think it'll take us a while uh, to really see how things have been affected in the long term. Um, Harris, uh, you had a, a a question. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Dylan, uh, John McDonough had a piece in Politico recently, uh, which seemed to downplay the possibility of Republicans really re reversing or rolling back the Affordable Care Act. But he talked to uh, Republican policy walks. But in fact, what mu much of what they said did, in fact, involve major rollbacks in ACA protections, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you think that perhaps reporters, including yourself, are underplaying the prospect that starting with the midterms and then going into the 2024, we might see, uh, if not repeal per se, major rollbacks in things like Medicaid, uh, which Republicans seem to hate. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. It's like, yeah, you should always like listen, you know, it's, it sounds like the most basic thing in the world, but yeah, like listening to what politicians and policy sort of tastemakers say and taking them seriously is sometimes like the easiest thing to forget to do. Um, and it's easy to kind of convince yourself that like, well, I've, I know how this is going to play out because I've been following healthcare for 10 years or even longer, I think in your case, Harris. So it's like, um, so yeah, I, I, I do, I, I should be on guard, I think against like the possible, you know, I, I, my, it's certainly my sense that like, there is a bit of fatigue among Republicans and, you know, with, with John's story, I, I haven't, uh, read it myself, but like, I could at least imagine a, like, of course you go like talk to the Republican healthcare folks and like, they've got, uh, their ideas about what they might want to do next, but like you to ask Mitch McConnell and he might like laugh you out of the office based on what he had to put up to what it, he had to put up with last time. Um, but nevertheless, like, I do think like, and, and, and I think your question gets at something, uh, that will potentially be challenging as reporters, which is that like, you know, these, these kind of ideological tit for tats can um, become sort of subtler and more nuanced over time. Like there can, you know, Republicans already made the grand attempt in 2017 uh, to repeal and replace Obamacare like they had been pr promising for so long. Um, but like, it's, yeah, not that hard to imagine, like if they, if they win a, a majorities in Congress and the White House in 2024, you know, maybe they, they kind of go with more like technical bills that don't kind of carry the weight of repeal and replace that nevertheless, you know, target things like the age band or essential health benefits or what have you. Um, or, you know, medic, you know, certainly Medicaid, I think is a space where it's like, you know, you've always got reauthorization bills or, uh, you know, the spending omnibus bills that can become riders or, and riders can be attached to those that make, you know, what sound like really technical, uh, changes, but that can be really meaningful in terms of how the program is actually implemented. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I, I, I would, I would adopt a stance of like, to your point, you know, taking Republicans seriously, it's not as if, there's been sort of a dramatic change of heart among, uh, you know, committed ideologues that like actually the ACA is great and we should push more and, uh, you know, to have more government involvement in, in healthcare. Like a lot of the, the deeply held precepts that motivated the repeal fight, I think are still there to your point. Um, it just, yeah, now becomes a question of like, how do they manifest themselves going forward? And just where does healthcare fall as a priority for the Republican party um, going forward? Because, you know, it had obviously been a very politically animating issue uh, during the Obama years. Um, and then they tried to, you know, uh, cash that in uh, in 2017 uh, to, disastrous results. And so now I think it's just a question of like, you know, should they win Congress and win the White House? Like, where does healthcare fall um, in the hierarchy of things that they that they want to get done? But I, I think you raise a, a totally fair point, which is that, you know, a lot of the the goals that they have laid out, um, you know, over the last decade or so when the healthcare debate's been a little more lively, um, you know, those haven't just dissipated because repeal failed. You know that we've got uh, we've got time for uh, 
Uh, one last question, and as the uh, moderator, it's my prerogative to uh, to ask it. Uh, this isn't a policy question at all, uh, but you know, one of the, one of the things I've enjoyed um, so much about your reporting is I think you are um, I, I I think you're a, a little bit different from a lot of other Washington D.C. based reporters in that you you really do try to get the patient perspective in there, and you talk to patients in your um, stories as you write about healthcare policy. Um, so I asked this of another speaker, but I'm, I'm curious to, to just hear any anything you have to share about it. What tips do you have for journalists on um, how to find patients who can tell these stories about, um, you know, just some of these awful experiences they've had, whether it's with junk insurance or, or surprise billing or, you know, take your pick. Um, and, and then what tips do you have on um, how, how to foster those relationships with patients and have those conversations uh, to get them to trust you and open up to you. Yeah. So on the first question about how to find patients, um, you know, I think providers are always your friend. Like, you know, they obviously, they have direct access to patients. They have a big uh, inventory of patients. And so, you know, I've certainly asked providers like, you know, I'm working on this story. I'm, I'm interested in this kind of person, you know, finding somebody in this situation. And, you know, if a doctor has somebody who fits that, fits that criteria, you know, they obviously know right away and, and they're often happy to help you to help make a connection, you know, make an introduction, make the patient feel more at ease, uh, that kind of thing. So I think providers can be your friend. I certainly think like community groups, uh, community, if, if for whatever reason you're covering a story where a a, co a community group or community coalition has formed, um, you know, they tend to have their, their ears to the ground, you know, for that maternity ward story that I referenced earlier, uh, I, I, through just interviewing uh, some of the members of the coalition that had, uh, that had come together to try to stop one in particular maternity ward from closing, they made a handful of people on, on that coalition made a handful of reference to like specific situations where like a pregnant woman had had to give birth on the side of the road or whatever. And so, you know, all it took was a, a follow-up question about, hey, who who were you talking about? And would you mind connecting me with them? Um, and, you know, I, I ended up talking to uh, a woman who had found herself in that exact situation. Um, the other that like, I don't know, might be more controversial, but uh, I have found it pays off if you use it correctly, would be social media. And honestly, Reddit in particular. Um, you know, there are a bunch of communities on there uh, that are dedicated to, you know, specific conditions, specific health professions or problems. Um, and, you know, like, just to give an example, I was doing a piece last summer on uh, Alzheimer's patients after the Azuhelm uh, news had come out. And so, I mean, I basically, you know, just kind of lurked on one of the Alzheimer's groups, you know, I was interested in finding some people who had found out relatively recently that either they or a loved one had Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, you know, it was just a matter of, you know, DMing some people who had made posts along those lines. I probably messaged, you know, 15, 20 people, heard back from only a handful, but like one of the women I, women I heard, heard back from was like, you know, a, a kind of perfect avatar for this story uh, and really helped to bring it to life. Um, so that, you know, social media certainly want to use carefully. Like I like talked to this woman on the phone and, you know, vetted her and what have you. It can obviously be a little bit uh, dicey if you're working uh, for, with anonymous accounts, at least from the start. Um, but yeah, you know, I think providers and community groups might be obvious, but I would not uh, kind of dismiss the potential of social media to especially kind of connect you with someone who's in a maybe a very particular situation that you're trying to find. Because I think if you troll suit some of those groups on Alzheimer's disease or cancer and that those kind of support groups, um, you know, especially if they're public, um, that can be uh, that can be a really valuable resource for finding individuals who can bring a story to life. Uh, great advice. Uh, well, Dylan, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, this was a lot of fun. I certainly learned a lot and uh, just very grateful for your time. Thank you again.